Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome um, to on this hot and steamy Sunday to our opening Zoom lecture uh, panel discussion. Um, my name is Julie Parati. For those of you I don't know out there, I'm the Martha R. Robinson Curator at the Dixon Gallery and Gardens. And uh, just once again, I want to thank you all for joining us on what I am sure will be a wonderful introduction um, to the work and the career of Wayne Tebow. As you all know, today is our official opening day um, for the Dixon's venue of Wayne Tebow 100, paintings, prints, and drawings. And we couldn't be more excited. The show just looks absolutely amazing in our galleries. Um, this retrospective exhibition of, you guessed it, 100 um, paintings, prints, and drawings is really just delightful, um, but it's a really special opportunity um, for all of us in Memphis to um, immerse ourselves in um, the career of this truly unique artist um, in American art history. Wayne Tebow 100 comes to us from our good friends um, at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. Uh, and we've collaborated with the Crocker several times over, on several projects over the years. Um, most recently, the America's Impressionism exhibition um, that the Dixon hosted earlier this year. And in just a few months, um, about 50 works from the Dixon's collection will be headed to Sacramento. Um, through the exhibition Monet to Matisse, Masterworks of French Impressionism from the Dixon Gallery and Gardens. So we wanna thank everybody at the Crocker um, for truly for their fortitude and their collegiality um, over the, the last year and a half as they have organized and traveled um, this huge exhibition in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, so we really wish that Scott Shields, who we'll meet in just a second, Lyle Jones, the director of the Crocker, and uh, of course, everyone in the Tebow family um, and our contributors to, our, to the Tebow catalog could all have um, come to Memphis to see the exhibition. Um, but thanks to the magic of Zoom, we're, uh, we are all able to gather together here on the computer today. So I think we can um, be grateful for that. <laughs> so before we get going, just one housekeeping note. Um, as the discussion is going on, if questions pop into your head, go down to the um, bottom of your screen, your Zoom window, and there'll be a little button that says Q&A. So you can type your questions in there. And at the end of the discussion, we will get to as many questions as we have time for. And I hope you'll feel free to, to ask away in there. Um, so our guide on our journey uh, into the world of Wayne Tebow today is Scott Shields. Scott serves as the Chief Curator and Associate Director of the Crocker Art Museum. Over the course of his 25-year mu museum career, Scott has organized more than 75 exhibitions and authored and contributed to numerous catalogs, um, including his brilliant essay, uh, on California Impressionism that I know many of you read in our uh, America's Impressionism catalog that came out earlier this year. Scott did an, uh, an amazing job, truly, um, curating Wayne Tebow 100, and I can't wait to learn more from him today. So Scott, we all wish you were here in Memphis, um, but know that we're all virtually clapping for you and welcoming you to the stage um, today. So hi, Scott, there you are. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much. That was very, very kind of you. And I'm so happy to be coming to you in, in Memphis. I, I wish I could be there in the flesh. Um, <laughs> it is hot here, just like it is there. So okay. <laughs> I think we're about the same, um, just a little drier perhaps. But I, it's such a thrill to be working with Wayne Tebow and on this show and to have it traveling the country. I remember distinctly when I was going to grad school at the University of Kansas, the Spencer Museum of Art had a painting by Wayne called Around the Cake. And I used to marvel at this painting and think, who is this guy? And then to end up in Sacramento where Wayne um, lives and has lived for such a long time, it, it's, it's pretty amazing and it's a great mm -hmm. privilege. Wayne had his first 
He first showed his work at the Crocker in the 1940s. He had his first one person show at the Crocker in 1951. And he's had a show every decade at the Crocker since um, up until the, to the most recent one to celebrate mm -hmm. his 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, I had some great writers and supporters and helpers in this project and the catalog I think is, is terrific in part because of the in large part because of all the wonderful people that contributed to it. And two of them are here today and it is Hearn Pardee, who is a professor of art studio at the University of California at Davis and holds an MFA from Columbia University. His own work addresses the landscape of Northern California. He also writes about art for the Brooklyn, look, excuse me, Brooklyn Rail and other publications. Um, and he contributed an essay about Kibo's works on paper to the catalog. Julia Friedman holds a PhD in the history of art and architecture from Brown University. She's an independent art historian, critic, and curator, and has been a regular contributor to Art Forum and the New Criterion. Her current research concerns Wayne Thiebaud's portraiture. And then we have a truly special guest, and that is Twinka Thiebaud, uh, an American model and icon who has posed for many of the most important photographers and artists of the 20th century, including her father, Wayne Thiebaud. Images of Twinka are held by museums around the world. And in 2022, the Crocker is going to feature Twinka in an exhibition called Girl in the Green Dress, Twinka Tebow and the Art of the Pose. So we're very excited about that. And because we opened this Tebow show in the middle of the pandemic and um, it was only open for about two weeks, it's gonna come back around and come back to Sacramento in 2022. So we, people will get to see it because there was a lot of complaining that Nobody got to see it. So with that, thank you panelists. If you can all turn your cameras on. So I think I see all of you. What I thought we'd do um, is start with a question for each panelist and then go to uh, some images because art history people love to work from images. We don't know how to deal with the world otherwise. And then we will come back, ask more questions, and then in the last 10 or 15 minutes, I'll take questions from all of you, if that seems amenable. I thought I'd start with Twinka. And, and the question is, why do you think your father's work is so beloved? Well, <clears throat> thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this. It means a lot to me to be here speaking about my dad's work and about my time with him as, as his daughter and one of his models. Um, I think my dad's work really speaks to the, the spirit of the child in all of us and the spirit of the, the nostalgia. And I, if you don't mind, I'd like to read just a couple stanzas from a poem I wrote recently. What kind of a man is the title of it? And it, and it goes, what kind of a man paints a lollipop stand? Cotton candy clouds and candy colored lands, rows and rows, slices of pies, stripes and polka dots, piles of ties. Here is a guy mixing paint on his palette, paints hot dogs and burgers and bowls of egg salad, cities on hills of vertiginous height, bakeries bursting with sugary bites. And it goes on and on, but I think that's just kind of shows you the spirit in which I was embracing my dad's work. And I think other people embrace it in that way too. I totally agree. Thank you for sharing that. So I'll go to Hearn. And the question is, you know, here's, here we have Memphis in, or Tebow's in Memphis at the Dixon. And do you think of Tebow as a California artist? Um, well, there's a, a temptation to categorize him that way because of his subject matter. Um, which includes the California landscape and all his displays of food, which seem identified with the culture of California and the automobile. But I think it's very dangerous to, uh, to just a lazy way to think of him, or also even just to think of him as an American artist, because it ignores his deep connections through his uh, interests throughout his life and, uh, and art of all cultures and throughout history. Um, I think of him, and his connection to California to me goes back to the um, philosophy of early uh, 20th century American art when you had people like Alfred Stieglitz and William Carlos Williams who talked about the local and uh, Stieglitz a photographer 
felt that it was important for American artists to emphasize the local, to connect to their own environment because he felt like people didn't really experience America deeply. Um, and Wayne has certainly helped us do that. But he said you also had to connect to the modern art of Europe. And he was bringing shows to his gallery in New York from uh, you know, the Cubists and the Impressionists. And um, he uh, encouraged artists to, uh, to bring together the uniqueness of the American experience in the broad context of, of art of the wider world and to experiment with things. And I think Wayne and his uh, uh, you know, thoughts about cubism, he, he thinks very philosophically about these things. And I hope that when people actually get to see the show as uh, I hope they will in Memphis, uh, they'll uh, look deeply and learn to appreciate all the connections that you can see to other artists work, uh, to Indian miniatures, to, uh, you know, history of, uh, you know, Western art in Europe uh, that, um, you know, put him into that larger context. Thank you. So Julia, welcome. Nice to see you. I, do you think perceptions of Thibault's paintings have changed over time? Uh, definitely, definitely so. Um, well, so when uh, uh, his first show, his first big show took place in 1962 in the Dion Museum, it featured uh, uh, the confections, the cakes, the ties, uh, all of the subjects that he's known for. And um, the kind of the first uh, perception of his work had to do with the subject matter because the subject matter was recognizable. It was, uh, it was very American. It was presented in a way that un underscored this American quality. And um, it actually had to do, in large part, it had to do with lighting because it was lit uh, with fluorescent lighting, which was the thing du jour. Um, and so the, the, the kind of the, the first, the very first perception was, well, this is the painter who sees uh, the everyday things, things around us and uh, shows them as they are. And so people could relate on that level. That was the general public. Um, right away, there was a sense that, uh, you know, people like to put artists into categories. And so, uh, <laughs> Uh, Wayne Thibault was tagged as a pop artist, which um, he uh, doesn't agree with now, and I don't think he agreed with it then. The problem for him uh, being perceived as a pop artist is he sees pop art as uh, done by designers, not painters. And uh, he is first and foremost a painter. So in an attempt to shake off that tag of a pop artist, he moved on to painting figures uh, soon after the initial still lifes uh, show. Um, but with the public, it was kind of, it's been really interesting. So at first um, he is the painter of Americana um, and then uh, people liked him right away and they never stopped liking him. Uh, no matter that he changed styles multiple times, he changed he moved from genre to genre, that goodwill, that sort of, um, you know, the, the kindness that he invests his paintings in was picked up on by the crowd, by, by the viewers. And, and, and uh, so there's this almost kind of a tennis match back and forth that has been going on for 70 years. Um, and of course, scholars try to make sense of what he's doing, but uh, and, and there has been really wonderful um, scholarship done on, on uh, Thibault's work, uh, uh, but uh, he is a very complex painter and there's always almost, it's kind of a slippery slope. Uh, people slide into uh, trying to simplify him, uh, but he's very complex and uh, uh, he has been 1962 and he's uh, now. Thank you. So I'm going to try to share my screen so we can look at some, some images. So I will start here. We have two self-portraits, uh, one done in 1947 and one done in 1989. And my question is for Twinka. And the question is, which of these do you feel better represents your father and why? 
Boy. Well, I would say I relate to both of these images. My father as a young man, vital and curious, interested in so many things in life that would make everyone, you know, take notice and be interested in those things too. Um, and then my father, as he is uh, at, at this stage in life, the mature, thoughtful, kind-hearted, um, curious man who uh, really is the kind of person who's far more interested in, in others and in other artists than he is in talking about himself. Great humility and humbleness. So I see, I see both sides of the coin here. Right. I think that's right, thank you. So here's one of the etchings in the exhibition um, and it's a cake window from his Delights series of 1964. And so my question, because Hearn wrote about this for the catalog is, Hearn, could you tell us about the techniques used in this print and about the Delight series as a group? Yes, well, um, I love this image. Uh, it kind of epitomizes Wayne's uh, interest in etching as a medium. Uh, he, he's quoted uh, in my article actually as saying that the etched line is one of the most profound and beautiful things he's experienced. That the authority you get from, from making that line, which is uh, then uh, treated with acid and filled with ink uh, and uh, creates this beautiful, uh, rich uh, darkness, which you can vary. And you see here how he's using the technique of the, the etched line as a way to uh, depict very different things, the, the shadows and light on the cakes. Uh, and he's also suggesting the window that we're looking through. And he's, he's very uh, clever in the way he uses that grid of, uh, you know, he's decided that there's some kind of uh, overlaying uh, surface there, screen that we're looking through. But then when he gets to the cakes, he doesn't Put that on top of the cakes. You know, it's as though when we're looking through the window, we're aware that there's a window, but we focus on the cakes. We don't really see the uh, the, the screen that we're looking through, and so uh, it, it shows the sophistication of, of his technique. He's not merely kind of reproducing a, a visual impression of things, and you can see how he's uh, loving these lines, and he, he lets each line be very distinct, uh, going different directions. Some of them are etched more deeply. And uh, you know, creating this, uh, you know, can, you can appreciate this at a purely aesthetic level is just the variety of, of markings and uh, effects, visual effects that he's created. And the whole series, which uh, he took uh, after he had had his uh, big show in 1962 and um, was very identified with the subject of uh, food. Um, I think what he's doing here is really showing the, the depth I was talking about before of kind of taking it to a more philosophical level with etching, which reduces everything to just these lines. There's no longer the material uh, surface of the frosting and the ice cream that, uh, that people could identify with very viscerally. Uh, mm. Here he's working on a more intellectual plane, but, but showing the same interest in the subject. And by doing, he did a whole series here with these uh, delights, uh, which are almost cinematic. If you look at them together, he shifts the, you know, the, the viewpoint, he does close-ups, he does some that are more um, very lightly done, some that are very dark, and you, um, you uh, cultivate a higher level of appreciation uh, for his work and for, for his way of uh, thinking about um, the process of, of working. And I think all through the show, we, we see how um, he, he adds this dimension to the, uh, you know, the appealing uh, subject matter with the uh, appeal of the, all, all the layers of materials that he's using. Thank you. So here's one called Green Dress, not in the show, um, but it will be in the show that we're doing um, of Twinka. And because it is Twinka in her green dress, girl in the green dress, and Twinka, my question for you is, what do you remember about posing for this painting? Well, like posing for most of the paintings for my dad, it was always a, a very somber and sort of serious undertaking. Being alone with my dad in the painting studio in the dead of winter, 
with maybe a little heater buzzing away, the heat of it, you know, scorching a leg and the rest of me being a little cold. Um, my dad look, doing a lot of looking at me, squinting, um, looking back at the canvas, moving in to, to draw with paint, stepping back. It was a little bit like being in a, monk, in a monk's cell. Uh, and my dad was really like a dancer when he painted. It, it was quite something to sit and observe him. There would be um, maybe pub public radio would be going or classical music. And then during the break, there would always be a delicious bowl of hot soup waiting for us. And um, it, it was really quite a privilege to be able to share those, that, that experience with him. So here we have pastel scatter from 1972. And we have people doing pastels with pastels. So question for her is to tell us about the medium of pastel and what is Kibo saying about it in this work? Well, the medium of pastel, again, like the, the etching of pastel is something he's, he's cultivated all his life and, and loves the richness uh, pastel, which is a dry medium, unlike paint, but it uh, produces an incredibly uh, saturated uh, beautiful uh, colors, which can be blended, as you can see here, the way the shadows and transparent uh, layers of, of color that he uh, evokes through the uh, way he works with the pastels. And uh, this uh, particular work uh, kind of extends on what I was uh, saying before, and that I, it shows him uh, engaging with abstract expressionism to me, you know, the use of color, and the idea that he's working with this flat field, which uh, the, the dominant critic at the time, Clement Greenberg, was always talking about the picture plane. And I think Wayne here, in a kind of ironic way, he's playful the way he does it, but he's, he's uh, not only just using pastels to, uh, to make a picture of pastels, uh, but he's also just using the plane of the, uh, of the paper as his medium. The plane is flat, but is it really flat? You're looking at it, no, it's a table. It's supposed to go back in space, but then he keeps contradicting it. Uh, you know, some of the pastels in the front are smaller than the ones so, sort of what would be the back of the plane. And uh, the plane seems to kind of shift as we look at it. We're constantly negotiating, trying to figure out where are we exactly relative to these uh, individual um, fragments of pastel that are lying around there. Uh, and I think it emphasizes his, uh, his approach to painting, which like the abstract expressionist was very visceral. It's about your body is engaged with it. It's not just your eye that's looking at this, you're, you're physically, um, if, you, if you stand and look at this painting, uh, this pastel for a while, you'll, you'll begin to uh, find yourself uh, judging where you are in space. And uh, you know, it becomes a, a, a phenomenological sort of experience more than just a visual, visual one. Uh, so uh, I find uh, there's a lot to talk about here. I don't know if that's enough. <laughs> but, Thank you. Uh, I'm really struck, I haven't looked at this for a little while, at how blue those shadows are. Pretty. Yeah, and I think he said that he just made this up. He didn't actually look at pastels, he was just inventing this. So you can get that sense of the um, you know, uh, extension of his work from, from responding very much to drawing from perception and looking at the way things would lie on a tabletop to just, uh, yeah. yeah, I like that, that one kind of in the middle there, that orange one that's almost horizontal, but not quite horizontal. We keep, I keep kind of looking at that to say, okay, show me where the table is. And then I try and locate the others, but then I keep going off into other spaces. So uh, I find that very abstract expressionist. Uh, it's, it's about the plane, but also about spaces, virtual Thank spaces you. within the plane. Thank you. And I've got another one for you in the steep street. Um, <laughs> color etching with aqua tint and handwork, crayon, colored pencil, graphite, gouache. So it's a lot going on. Um, tell us about some of those different processes. Yeah, this. well, this one, I, I love just the, the wall text for that when you see all these different things he's using. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the delight series are very simple in the way he's using just one technique. But here, uh, he's, uh, he's started with a print, uh, an etching, but a color etching, which means he used colored ink and not just the black and white. And aqua tint is another uh, technique that you use with uh, acid that creates a sort of dust 
on the plate that um, when it's uh, inked, it, it acquires a tone. It, it makes up a kind of uh, uh, flat tone rather than just a line. And so he's combining these etching techniques, but then going on top of that with the crayon colored pencil, uh, graphite and gouache. Gouache is a form of watercolor, which is uh, more opaque than the uh, uh, ordinary watercolor is. And um, I find here, uh, it, it's just, he's just delighting in the, in the richness of materials. He, uh, again, the, the materials are not adding that much in the sense of making it more realistic exactly. They're just adding more visual experiences, more layers to our uh, perceptions of this uh, street, uh, which is not that exaggerated if you've been to San Francisco. But um, what he's doing here is, is also kind of, uh, he, he plays with perspective. And here he's sort of like taking the street and kind of uh, pulling it up to a vertical uh, in the center of the painting so that we're kind of stabilizing ourselves around that and uh, creating a, you know, to me, this is a very abstract cubist kind of composition that he's doing with these uh, shapes all arranged around the, uh, a planar focus, a little like the pastel scatter, only this time much more, uh, I'd say almost Byzantine, the way he's got these formal, uh, you know, vertical uh, axes running through it. But, uh, but again, it's just a, a delight in materials and then, you know, details that we still observe in there we can recognize uh, familiar landmarks uh, from uh, the city of San Francisco. That, uh, and of course the street looks like a street. He's got all the lanes marked off on there and uh, um, layers of shadows. He's using the, the transparency of these added materials to uh, enhance the shadows. I guess we could say that there's a, you know, a realistic uh, underlying motive to, uh, to a lot of the layering uh, and just to get the way light actually reflects off of things in nature. Thank you. I will say to the people of Memphis who haven't been to San Francisco, this may look crazy, but if you're in a stick <laughs> shift and you've been on one of those streets, you feel this. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. Yeah. I was there not long ago and I got to the top of the hill and I said, can I really go down this? The car is going to fall. You know, it's too <laughs> steep. <laughs> so not to ignore Julia. Um, so here we have a print of the Valley Farm from 1993 and a put up against it a cartoon by George Harriman, who we know Thibaut admired. So the question for Julia is, tell us about the importance of cartooning in Thibaut's work. Well, cartooning is hugely important because uh, um, on, on one level, it is important for uh, the way, the way uh, uh, Wayne uh, began to, to paint. Uh, he says that the artist who actually uh, caused him to think about fine art was George Harriman, who is known as a cartoonist. But of course, already in the 20s when he was uh, making the Crazy Cat cartoons, uh, he was hailed in the late 20s, he was hailed as a fine artist. So known as a cartoonist, but truly a fine artist. Um, and uh, um, uh, so that is kind of one big, big uh, marker. The other one is that uh, when Wayne was young, he um, worked uh, for Walt Disney as a cartoonist when he was, uh, uh, during the war, he was uh, uh, also uh, doing cartooning. So that was kind of a side gig from the very beginning. And later on, uh, it was kept as um, almost kind of a private activity, well, sort of because he did submit his cartoons to the New Yorker repeatedly uh, for those caption, um, uh, for those caption um, uh, contests. Uh, never get in, uh, which is really funny because uh, I think if I'm correct, he had 10 covers in the New Yorker. Uh, he did art for 10 covers and never was able to get a cartoon in. However, he always uh, continue, continued to make cartoons and the uh, uh, Thibaut Foundation has an incredible uh, stash of um, his cartoons, uh, both from when he was a young man, uh, from uh, the wartime, and then uh, from the 60s, uh, he did uh, wonderful uh, cartoons uh, uh, for his family members. Um, he did really um, witty and, and um, sometimes kind of brutal uh, cartoons uh, about the art world. 
I uh, really hope that those get published at some point. They're really good. They're as good as I think uh, Ed Reinhardt's uh, takedowns of the art world. Um, so cartoons, they have been there throughout. Um, when I asked Wayne about uh, the importance of cartoons in formal uh, terms, um, he spoke about um, the convention. So he's really quite interested in what he calls the painting convention. How do we perceive things? And so what happens in cartoons, you have, if you're looking at the Valley Farm here, for example, you see that little tree uh, on the side and the tree actually looks kind of like a convention of the tree. And then you have a convention of the house and a little cow. And so what happens in cartooning, you're able to uh, suspend disbelief and make things very almost improbable uh, to play with the scale. So the cow is really tiny in comparison uh, to this uh, uh, pond. And, and actually, so I hope, uh, please remember that image because I'll, I'll come back to that, to the little uh, somebody on the edge of a big light circle. Um, so uh, it really, uh, I would say that cartooning for uh, Wayne Thibault is a way to um, cross that line of you know, enforce seriousness uh, and uh, to, to engage in levity, which is, uh, and Twinka will speak to that, I hope, uh, as a person, uh, he, uh, he has a wonderful sense of humor. Um, and uh, uh, so it kind of comes across into, into his uh, art, uh, which is uh, engaged with this levity, which actually helps it to be more serious in a way because uh, he stays away from um, uh, from things that are uh, just um, rote repetitions of what you're supposed to do. So he does things in you and cartooning helps with that a great deal. Thank you. So on this theme of humor and cartooning is it, this piece of stuffed toys, which you just can't help but smile when you see this, this painting. And my question is for Twinka, tell us about your father's sense of humor. Oh. You know, my father was a wonderful clown. <laughs> he could make the best faces, a series of hilarious faces that would, it would just, you know, make our toes curl with laughter. Um, always joking, tell, and, and then later in life, really got into telling very detailed, great jokes with accents and, you know, long, and I don't know how he could even remember some of them, but he was terrific joke teller and he loves to, uh, he loves to hear a good joke. And uh, I would say that he just, he has a, a, a very light um, sense of humor um, and a kind sense of humor. So hanging out with him and especially at a party, he, he could just be a blast to be around. Thanks, and then I think you're gonna see it in this next one, Clown with Red Hair. Um, and so my question is for Julia, what do you think he was saying with this painting? Um, so actually, let me start by saying, um, so the previous image with the cow on the edge of the pond, remember there was a circle, right? So you have a very similar composition. Of course, you have a figure here. And uh, so what's going on here is really important. It is uh, for Wayne, first and foremost, paintings are, um, uh, they're uh, paintings. They're, in, they're, they're there in order to create uh, something out of nothing, out of pigments, out of uh, uh, whatever uh, materials he's using. And so uh, he always, um, uh, he always uh, seeks uh, to, 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 to engage geometry. So the circles and uh, the, uh, in case of the pies, uh, you would have other geometric shapes. Um, they're really important. So there's that level. It's, it's a painting first and foremost, but the subject matter of this painting is also really important. So as uh, you probably, uh, know if you have seen the catalog, uh, this painting comes, it's uh, one of the latest uh, works uh, that uh, Wayne uh, had done. It comes from a series which is called Clowns. There is an exhibition of 
clown paintings and drawings and etchings right now still in the Laguna Art Museum in California. And uh, the series came about uh, uh, about five, it took him five years to paint it. And the series is uh, his recollections of the Ringling Brothers Circle a circus that he saw uh, as a young teenager in the 19, early 1930s. And so this figure of a clown is a very multifarious figure because, you know, on one level, it is a clown. So it's a clown in the circus and it recalls the memories. Uh, the color palette is really interesting because it actually anchors this uh, uh, depression era palette uh, with um, uh, darker kind of, uh, um, uh, toned down colors and uh, it looks like the light is uh, an incandescent light as opposed to the uh, fluorescent light of the early still lights. Um, uh, but uh, then there's another level to this painting which is a philosophical level. Uh, the figure of the clown is um, in a way it's a stand-in for uh, a human being. Uh, clowns uh, are uh, uh, they, they go through the same path, although within the show as we do, uh, we uh, are born, we act, uh, we live through emotions, and then we bow out. Uh, so that's kind of the process of life. So there's that. And um, uh, th there's this tension between kind of the brightness and the pathos and the happiness of the circus, uh, but also sadness and and the, the tragedy of life and the difficulties one experiences and that tragic comic um, uh, uh, tension, uh, the tragedy and the comedy is also reflective of what everyone uh, goes through in the course of their life. So it's a very loaded painting, beautiful painting. And uh, of course, it also looks back to the older work. I've got one more clown and this is it's not in the show, not in the catalog because he painted it after all those things were done, but it, it's the 100 year old clown, which seems incredibly poignant given he is 100. So Julia, um, it's sort of a philosophical summation of the series. Can you analyze it for us? Absolutely. And actually, so in the painting was literally finished um, right uh, before his uh, uh, birthday in November. So it was on the easel in late October. Um, it is a very interesting painting. It is, uh, he, Wayne calls it, he, he says that this is a summation of the clown series. Uh, I would say that it is also a reference to uh, all sorts of works that he has done throughout his life. And it's really interesting in that it combines different genres. So you have uh, you know, ostensibly it's a portrait, uh, possibly a self-portrait. We could talk about that later. Um, but also it has elements of landscape. So if you look at the skull cap, it looks like the mountain landscapes, which Wayne has been painting since the 1960s and still paints. Um, the jacket of the clown uh, looks like the, uh, the uh, road in San Francisco cityscapes, and it even has the same zip. Um, and uh, if you look at the ear, the ear looks like uh, it recalls the Delta, uh, Sacramento Delta landscapes uh, that he also, one of his uh, well-known series. And of course, there's an element of a still life, which comes both uh, across, uh, comes across both in the kind of caked uh, impasto makeup and the little cherry uh, on the top of the nose. Um, and, and you could see the, uh, this little red dot, it, it is all smudged, it is it's imperfect, which is also a really, really important uh, idea uh, in Wayne's work. Um, he never looks for perfection. He never looks for finality. Uh, he understands um, uh, the, the complexity of things. Uh, and uh, so this is almost kind of a reference, an implicit reference to uh, the vulnerability to the um, difficulty of life. Uh, and of course, all of this is overlaid with um, the age of the clown and on many levels through other works. It is also a reference to one of his favorite painters, Pierre Bonnard, um, uh, 
uh, so uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot to unpack in this one. Oh, and uh, I should uh, mention the, of course, the background is the classic tea bowl, this white, you know, bluish white background, which we also see. So it, it, it kind of codes uh, all of his work in a, in a way. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to ask one more question of each panelist, and then we're going to take questions from all of you. So I'll start with Twinka, and that is, what would people be surprised to learn about your father? I would say that he is really one of the of the kindest, uh, most gentle people in the world, and who is interested in so many different aspects of art and culture and and is a and is an absolutely wonderful mentor and teacher i don't know some people may not know that about him but he's revered as a as a professor and a teacher and he certainly taught all of us lots of wonderful skills as kids um, he taught his daughters how to be great dance partners how to make a great pot of beans, how to make a good salad dressing, how to balance a checkbook, um, practical things that a lot of people might, might not know that artists you know, are involved in. So uh, my dad is just an exceptional human being and a wonderful friend and mentor to many people and to, especially to artists. He, he loves to promote uh, other painters and He's a, he's a great friend and teacher. Thank you. And that's a perfect segue because I, would, I want to ask Hearn, because you're a, you teach art and studio, um, how do you think teaching has impacted Thibaut's work? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would see it as a kind of one-way thing. I think he goes back and forth with teaching and working. Um, his, uh, he's been a teacher from the very beginning uh, he credits his uh, early experience in teaching with uh, awakening him to the richness of art history and to uh, the broader uh, ideas about art that he had not absorbed when he was, uh, you know, working in commercial uh, drawing earlier in his career. And uh, I've observed him teaching. I, I was a student of his in a way. He came to the New York Studio School back when I was in art school, and he was visiting New York at the time. And uh, I was able to work with him in Paris when he took a group of studio school students to Paris and we spent time in the museums and I think uh, his, his teaching is, is integral to that sense of art history and to looking at art and uh, bringing students to look at art in a museum um, was, uh, was an important element in his teaching and uh, as it was in his own work. So I think there's kind of a, a continuity. Uh, he's always learning. He sees himself as a student of painting and uh, and I, as a teacher, I, I can't help but uh, admire his, his the energy and, and patience he brought to teaching where he would do demonstrations. I do that occasionally, but I'm very hesitant to get up there and actually paint something myself, but that was very much a part of his practice. And so just the, the, the incredible uh, effort uh, and exertion that he put into teaching uh, was really, uh, has been kind of an inspiration to me and uh, typifies his, his work in painting. I think, well, that's what you have to do. And that's the kind of attention that you, you bring to whatever it is you're doing, whether you're making a painting or whether you're trying to help somebody uh, do it for themselves. Wonderful. And actually, if I may add something to what Hearn was just saying, there is, uh, uh, to illustrate the point, there is a show, uh, I'm not sure if it's still on, but in the Marinetti Schrem Museum, there is an exhibition, Wayne Thiebaud Influencer, which is essentially an exhibition of uh, the work of his students right. uh, who come from all uh, places uh, in the art world. Yes, it's still on. People can come to Davis. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. To circle back to you, Julia, you talked early on about how Wayne didn't really like the label of a pop artist. And I'm curious, do you think he was a pop artist? And if he isn't, uh, what separates his work from pop artists? Um, I think he's right. He's actually, so Wayne, one, one of the remarkable things about Wayne is that he's extremely self-aware as a painter. He knows exactly uh, what he is going after. 
Um, and uh, his early work um, was pretty much, and he, he speaks about it, uh, was predicated on his desire to represent geometrical figures, but in the guise of real objects. So the cakes were the circles and they were the, the wedges, uh, the triangles. Uh, and um, so he never, this, the thing about pop art, American pop art, so I'm, I'm, leaving, I'm leaving the ICA, the English pop artists uh, who were there a good decade before in the 50s, I'm leaving them aside, but American pop. American pop is um, uh, basically, uh, it, it fetishizes the object, the everyday object, the object itself is really important. So, uh, and it also aims to, very importantly, it aims to erase the, artist's hand. So even though every pop artist, you know, you can always tell Warhol from Oldenburg, you know, from Liechtenstein, they, they all, they have, they have their own language, but all of them aim to make it as mechanical as possible. What Wayne is doing is completely opposite. He's uh, actually, he's first and foremost, he's a painter. So he never makes you forget. He never lets you forget that it, what the object that he represents, no matter how truthfully, is painted. There's always a brush stroke. There's always um, uh, the really, uh, you know, strong sense of uh, conversation going on between the support and the medium in which he's working. So it's always there. Uh, so he's absolutely not a pop artist. Uh, he is definitely uh, an American artist. Uh, because uh, what he represents is represents a certain you know uh, time and and culture in American history, no question about that. But he's not a pop artist, and despite the fact that he was trained originally as a designer, uh, he uh, never uh, went to art school. Uh, he's still uh, ages uh, away. Like he's it's completely completely different situation from people who uh, form American pop. Wonderful, thank you. So Julie, I'm hoping that maybe some people have come up with some questions for us. Yes, they have. Thanks everyone, that was wonderful. So interesting. And I have a bunch of, of questions myself. We'll see how many we can get to. Um, so uh, Norwood Creech, I, I've had a couple people ask and Beth about um, Thibaut's favorite artists. Uh, Norwood mentions actually in 1993, I was fortunate to work with Wayne in Santa Fe. He discussed his admiration for uh, Morandi, so Giorgio Morandi, and introduced me to the works of Giacometti, um, Alberto Giacometti maybe, or Diego. Would you be able to discuss or name other artists he holds dear? And of course you mentioned Bonard earlier, but I don't know if there are other artists um, that are particularly, you know, influential for him and also, you know, just some favorites that he's had over the course of art history. Of course, Hearn mentioned going to museums in Paris with him. So I don't know if there's, are there any others? Well, I would just mention, if we're in the context of Paris, I think Degas is an artist that he's very identified mm. with, which uh, um, if you think of the colors, the way Degas used pastel, the way he mm -hmm. mixed paint with pastel and, and uh, with prints, he was very innovative in the way he used prints and things. And he and Degas was also, well, Wayne likes to point out, Degas was also interested in food and he wrote poetry. And so uh, he was a wide ranging and he was, uh, he was a little contrarian. He didn't uh, identify as an impressionist, you know, just like Wayne does not identify as a pop artist. Uh, he exhibited with the impressionist to a certain extent, but he said, uh, you know, painting is not an outdoor sport. And he uh, was, uh, you know, uh, very much following his own path. And I mean, Wayne loved so many artists, uh, great artists of the past, like Velasquez and so forth. But I think uh, as a, he, he uh, would identify with someone like Degas, I think in a more personal way. Mm -hmm. Cool, I can see that, especially with the prints and how there's, especially the one that you showed of the cityscape in San Francisco, where it's all mm. these different processes layered over one another. Anybody yeah, also, oh, sorry. Oh, I was saying, does anybody have others? So go ahead, Julia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Wayne has uh, really extensive knowledge of art history. Uh, extensive and very deep. And um, there's some very, so 
you know, aside from kind of the usual suspects like Velasquez and Goya and um, um, and uh, um, uh, Dumyi would be a very, uh, very much beloved figure by him. And of course, Dumyi's ability uh, to represent um, people in, in a way that derives uh, from cartooning, essentially. So it's, it's very shorthand, but extremely expressive. And uh, the fact that Demier actually, uh, he's an artist artist, so that there are lots of kind of interesting uh, things there. Um, but also of course, Morandi. Morandi is uh, uh, hugely important. Um, and uh, Fontaine Latour and um, uh, just, okay, let me think. Um, I have one that's closer to the home and that's Richard Diebenkorn. Right, right, right. Well, yeah. we didn't get to American artists. We're still in Europe. <laughs> okay, hey, here's the bridge. Here's the bridge. How about Balthus? Oh, yeah, Balthus. Yeah. He likes Balthus because Balthus was a, an extremely um, uh, complex and strange painter and very unique. And so, uh, yeah, and then going to American painters, Dibbenkorn. And you worked on that, right, Scott? I did, yeah. People got to see those early shows of the Bay Area figurative painters and talks about sitting there and drawing from those, those paintings, Diebenkorn in particular. And then when you see Diebenkorn doing his um, Berkeley street scenes, it's kind of like Wayne took those and put them vertically and started to create his own landscapes. So there's a definite thread in California's art history that, that Wayne continues and adds upon. And also de Kooning. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, from, from the other shore. Yeah. What else do you have, Julie? Um, let's see, the, I have a question for Julia. It's, uh, this is from Clay. Julia, give the audience a teaser about Wayne's late self-portraits, uh, referencing what Twinka said regarding her father's earlier self-works. Uh, hi, Clay. Um, well, I actually, I want to say, first of all, that I loved uh, the way Twinka described uh, the early portrait and the late, later portrait. Not late, right? Because it's from the 80s. Um, I think this is absolutely correct. So there's some sort of traits that come out in the early works uh, and the, the later ones. And so um, Wayne has done some interesting stuff with portraiture. First of all, he uh, for some years, uh, on and off, he would do this kind of one uh, a day sketch, self-portrait, like a really quick one. Um, and that was uh, an interesting, it was a drawing exercise, but it was also kind of a um, almost, you know, uh, um, almost kind of like taking notes on the self in a way. Um, there are several incredible self-portraits that he has done, and this is what uh, I'm sure Clay has seen them. Uh, he's uh, uh, close to Wayne. Um, they're incredible self-portraits that Wayne has painted in the last few years. And uh, they, they take us further than that painting from the 80s that Twink was talking about, because now he's 100 or he was almost 100. And so there's all that wisdom and all the uh, humility that Twink mentioned. It is absolutely kind of an essential feature of Wayne. And because, you know, he is so revered and so respected, but he's truly humble and things don't get to his head. And so um, he's in the later works, he relates to other painters who painted themselves in the uh, advanced age, including uh, Bonar. Uh, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating works and um, very heavy, very philosophically heavy because they, they, they do pose the question of sort of the end of the journey and the, you know, the personal responsibility and, you know, where do we come from? Where are we going? They're, they're, they're kind of mushrooming and, and they're, they're really big. They, they correspond to the complexity of Wayne now as a painter, as a human being. And then there's still this element of kindness and um, generosity and open-mindedness, uh, which is there. So um, amazing, amazing work. Late work is amazing. Um, let's see, we have a question from Kevin Sharp, our director. Hi, Kevin. 
Did Wayne Thiebaud ever make copies after the early art, earlier artists he admired? So I think somebody mentioned um, sketching at the Bay Area, um, some of the Bay Area artist shows, but are there others that you, or just examples, uh, works that still survive of um, sketches he did after other artists? Domier. Domier, he, he did sketches of, there's a, um, in the 70s, he did a sketch of two figures that Domier painted. I, can't, I will say, I can't think of a lot. I think what he did more of was he would look at an, a master work or an old master work and turn it into a current work. So you might have overtones of say the Virgin Mary, but suddenly in his hands, it turns her into a tennis goddess, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, he, he really changes it up most of the time. He doesn't kind of stick with what's there, but kind of brings it into his own contemporary realm. He's very much about uh, having his students copy from masterworks. When I was first uh, interested in painting myself, he brought me to his studio and he said, well, let's copy a painting together. <laughs> And uh, he took the painting, a, a, a reproduction, took it out of the book and turned it upside down. And that's how we copied it because he didn't want me to focus so much on trying to be perfect, but to try to get the essence of the painting. And, uh, and he's copied quite a few paintings himself, but I don't think he shows those. They're just, it's, it's an exercise. He, he sees a painting, he enjoys and copies it. And I've, that's how I learned how to paint primarily, just going into art books and copying lots of different painters whose work I admired. He told me, don't go to art school, copy. You'll learn more from that than going to an art school. <laughs> Save a lot of money too. <laughs> um, okay, if there's another one. Uh, did Thibaut ever paint abstracts in the style of abstract expressionists? He did. There's, he, he did, he did. And actually I have seen one painting, it's at the foundation, which I think is really wonderful because it is a definitely an abstract expressionist painting, uh, but it channels symbolist painting really heavily. Um, so it does have um, some hints of figuration in it, but it's basically, it's an abax painting. And it's a really good one, a big one. And there's one in the show called The Sea Rolls In, which is pretty abstract. I mean, it, if you can still, it's, you can see it's an ocean, you can see the, the surf coming in, um, but it, it's still strongly, strongly influenced by abstract expression. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to, whoever asked that, you'll have to come see the show. Um, to see that it's a large painting. It's really, really amazing. And it's uh, wonderful in the gallery where we have it installed to see how he makes the leap from that style of painting. And then just on the other you know, wall in that gallery, we get to the still lifes that um, some of those early still lifes that we all, you know, are instantly recognizable as his. Um, so I think that's interesting. Let's see, we've had one question pop up. Oh, so someone says, I'm coming. I'll be there to see the show in the gallery Saturday. Um, I have uh, one final question. It's a little bit about what Twinka has said about her experience posing for her father. And uh, my question is about his artistic practice. Um, it seems like from going through the show, you can tell how amazingly productive he was. Is he a, you know, daily art? Is he a very scheduled um, artist? regimented in the way, you know, the times he works and the days he works. What is his um, practice like? Who wants Anyone? That? Who wants to handle that? <laughs> I would say he is. I, I think he paints, tries to paint every day. I mean, it, it, he, is, he is driven. He's very prolific and productive. Um, and he's still painting. So, you know, great artists don't retire. They just, they just keep. 
Exactly. Yeah, he, has, he has incredible work ethic and um, what helps it, uh, we actually, we, we talked about it uh, quite a few times because, so there's one part which is, it, he really does, I mean, it's the work ethic, right? So uh, uh, Wayne comes to the studio and it used to be, um, I don't know if it's what, what's going on right now, but it used to be there was a morning session and then tennis and then more painting. Uh, but um, uh, what is behind it is his desire to paint and his realization that he likes to say, I'm very uh, fortunate to be able to do this. So it's not a chore. So there's, yes, there's amazing work ethic and many hours, uh, but it's not, it's not just, you know, um, just being there and just waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. And he works on many canvases simultaneously usually. So it's not that he finishes one and then he moves on. He has a few things that he works on and they rotate and some of them um, uh, take a very long time, others less, but it's literally, um, it, 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 this is somebody who lives painting, you know, and it's, it's really quite incredible. Also, I wanted to um, just quickly say that there's really no contradiction between the abstraction and figuration for him, because so the early um, still lives, they were about abstraction and what Twinka says when, when he taught her how to paint and things went on their side. This is, this is exactly the same things because he's trying to uh, not have you be distracted by what's in the painting, but see the forms. He did the same thing with the clown. One of the clown works when I was in the studio, he turned it on the side and he said, look at it now. And it was, you know, it was a circle and a stripe and a circle and a stripe. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 not the abstract expressionism, but abstract painting is completely intrinsic to his work, even when it is figurative, even when we see what's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think that's uh, might be all of the questions that we have. Actually, we had one, one question that I can easily answer. Um, was asking about the catalog for the exhibition where you can, um, and yes, we have one available in our shop and I would show you my catalog, but it's holding my laptop up to keep it from overheating. Um, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's a wonderful catalog and Julia, Scott and Hearn have all contributed to it. Um, there, you, there it is, there it is. And um, it's on view, uh, it's for sale in our shop right now. Um, and I hope you all will come see this show. It's on view at the Dixon um, through October 3rd. And I should also mention we have in our uh, regional contemporary galleries, our Mallory and Wurzberger galleries an exhibition of Greeley Myatt's work. Um, it's a, a collection of his, uh, Greeley Myatt is a sculptor here in Memphis. And it's a collection of his uh, sculptures of, of cakes and um, ice cream cones and treats that he's done over the years. Um, so it's a wonderful time to be visiting the Dixon. And I just wanna thank everyone um, on here today. And Scott, thank you so much for bringing all of these wonderful people together um, for the so Dixon. To, I'm so grateful to the wonderful people for, for participating. So thank you. Thank you yeah, all. Been, thank you, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you all. Have a Hope great we can nice welcome you all there. soon to the Dixon. But yeah, and um, thank you so much for sharing your time today. Thank you, Scott, too. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.